Welcome to our worship service this morning. We're so glad that you've uh, joined with us today. Uh, not simply that you've come to join with us, but that in your heart you have set aside time uh, to come before the Lord, to worship him, uh, and to do that even online with, with others. Uh, we're working together uh, to be able to meet soon. Uh, we hope to give you some more news very shortly. Uh, it, it will be a staged return to gathering together. Uh, and even when we do, our services will still appear in this space uh, each Sunday as we live stream. As we come to worship this morning, I wanted to read some verses from Matthew chapter 16. Now when Jesus had come into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The gospel does still advance in our world, uh, but it does not advance unopposed. Uh, opposition uh, against the gospel, uh, against the good news uh, of Jesus Christ uh, is persistent. And, and we'll see that in Acts chapter 25 this morning. But we have a saviour who has the final say. Uh, we have a saviour who says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Uh, as willful as the opposition to uh, the gospel may be around our world, uh, whether it's in places where uh, persecution is rife or, or whether it is more subtle perhaps in, in our own context, uh, Jesus is still building his church. And we see even in the death of Jesus on the cross, uh, that was purposed to prevent everything that he had been sent by the Father to do, uh, we find that the Father is in fact accomplishing everything that he purposed, even through the actions that oppose it. And so we can have a sh this assurance. Uh, it's the same today. Jesus is building his church. And the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. Let's pray and commit our time of worship now to the Lord. Father, our heart's greatest desire uh, and delight is to meet with you because you have made us for yourself. And so in you alone we find wholeness and our greatest joy. We marvel at all that you have done and all that you continue to do. Especially we marvel that you should love us and show us grace and provide a way for us to be welcome into your presence, to be restored into a relationship with you, uh, to enjoy what we were created for in the very first instance. Thank you that all of this centers on Jesus, 
uh, on his life and death and resurrection as our representative, as our sin bearer, as our righteousness, as our victorious saviour. Thank you that he is building his church, his people, through the ages. And the gates of hell will not stand against it. And that includes all opposition to him uh, in our world today. It cannot prevail against what he is doing. In our own hearts, we pray, Father, that he may tear down every apathy, every wandering desire, every self-centered motive. May the Holy Spirit show us the true state of our hearts that we may seek you and desire your righteousness more earnestly. Forgive us for every sin in the things we do, say and think and love. And may we hunger for the righteousness that you alone give. May our lives have the savour of Jesus' character and his grace about them. And may his unstoppable kingdom come in fullness. This morning, Father, fill us with a certain hope and refocus the longings of our hearts on Jesus and the future that is ours in him. Make him our greatest delight and seeing every aspect of life as belonging to him, may we live life accordingly. And we pray that all the glory be his as we worship together in his name today. Amen. We're going to join our voices in praise of the Lord. It's one of our delights and privileges as Christians to, to sing his praise, to put the truths of scripture uh, to, to music and, and to express it in song. So we're going to uh, begin our, our service singing together uh, two uh, songs. The first is a hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. And then we're going to sing together, All My Ways Are Known to you. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is your health and salvation. Come all who and sisters draw near, praise Him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord above all things so mightily reigning, keeping us safe at His side so gently sustaining have you not seen all you have needed has been met by his gracious ordaining praise to the Lord who shall prosper and mercy shall daily attend us. Ponder on you what the Almighty can do, who with His love will befriend us. Praise to the Lord, O Lord, 
Elohim. Oh, that has life and breath come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly with praise we adore. Days of peace and days of rest In times of loss and loneliness The rich or poor, your word is true That all my ways are known to you No trial has come beyond your hand No step by day Sandra is going to bring us our first Bible reading for this morning. Our reading is taken from Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 3 through to verse 18. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, 
filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of good will. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defence of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this I rejoice. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. As we have been doing throughout the year, we continue to look at the New City Catechism this morning, uh, in which we learn the truths of God's Word in a question and answer format. And we're up to question 46 today, and it asks, what is the Lord's Supper? The answer is, Christ commanded all Christians to eat bread and to drink from the cup in thankful remembrance of him and his death. The Lord's Supper is a celebration of the presence of God in our midst, bringing us into communion with God and with one another, feeding and nourishing our souls. It also anticipates the day when we will eat and drink with Christ in his Father's kingdom. 1 Corinthians 11 and verses 23 to 26 say this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Ligon Duncan comments, the Lord's Supper is a covenant sign and seal. It both represents and confirms to us the precious promise of God that, through Jesus Christ, he will be our God and we are his people. In the Lord's Supper we have a remembrance, a celebration of God's presence and an experience of communion. We also have something that nourishes us, and in the Lord's Supper, we anticipate the glory to come. First, we have a remembrance. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus told his disciples that they were going to proclaim his death until he comes. The bread and the wine, the body and the blood of Christ in the Lord's Supper is a representation of a covenant sacrifice. He gave himself as a sacrifice in our place for the forgiveness of our sins. And so every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are to remember the meaning and significance of the death of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Second, the Lord's Supper is also a celebration of God's presence. Isn't it amazing that we're invited to slide our knees up under the table of God? That is especially amazing in the light of our rebellion. At the Lord's table, the Lord himself invites us back into his presence. When Jesus says to his disciples, take and eat, he reverses the words of the serpent in the garden. It's a celebration of our reunion with God, his presence with us, and our enjoyment of his near fellowship. Third, the Lord's Supper is a communion. 
It's a communion with God and with his people. We not only commune with the living God by grace, by what Jesus has done for us on the cross, but we commune with one another. When we're united to the Lord Jesus Christ, we're united to everyone who is united to the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, the Lord's Supper is spiritual nourishment. It's a means of grace. It's one of God's appointed ways by which he builds us up and nourishes us, confirms our faith, and strengthens us for growth. And the Lord's Supper is an anticipation of the glory to come. When the great end has come and all have acknowledged him to be king, he says on that day, he will bid us all to recline, just like the disciples reclined on the night of the Lord's Supper, and he will gird himself and serve us. Yes, in the Lord's Supper, we anticipate the marriage supper of the Lamb, where we will sit down with one another in glory, and our Saviour will serve us again everything that we need. What a joy it is to come to the Lord's table. Well, let's turn back to the question and answer. Uh, I'm going to ask the question and you can respond uh, with the answer in your homes. Uh, what is the Lord's Supper? Christ commanded all Christians to eat bread and to drink from the cup in thankful remembrance of him and his death. The Lord's Supper is a celebration of the presence of God in our midst, bringing us into communion with God and with one another, feeding and nourishing our souls. It also anticipates the day when we will eat and drink with Christ in his Father's kingdom. Let's say this prayer together. Bread of life, we take the Lord's Supper in reverent obedience. We do not want to receive it unworthily, so we come in repentance and faith. Help us to forgive the sins of those who have sinned against us, especially the believers with whom we share the bread and the cup. May our partaking of this meal proclaim your saving death and our desperate need of it. Amen. We're now going to join in singing again the Lord's praise, recognising that he is the God who is sovereign over all things. He is the God who leads us in this world, who controls the circumstances of our life, uh, and he is uh, the one who calls us to follow. And so we sing together, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
of sight, death of death, and hell's destruction. Land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to thee. I will ever give to Songs of praises, songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever give to thee. This month, our mission focus is on Calvin and Ruth Matthews, who are serving with Wycliffe uh, in uh, Ukarumpa in Papua New Guinea. Uh, I just want to provide you a, a brief update this morning, and uh, following that, come sing. We'll pray for them as uh, he also uh, leads us in prayer for the church and the world. They report that uh, life has also been disrupted for them uh, by COVID-19 as it has for us. Uh, all departments, they tell us, were closed, as was the international school. Uh, for a term, uh, just as we have had to, to do in Melbourne, they had to endure the rigours of online school for their kids. Uh, Many of the Wycliffe uh, staff, many of the missionaries there in Ukarumpa, uh, returned to their home countries uh, with the, uh, the coming of uh, COVID-19. Uh, the continued availability of Ruth's medications meant that uh, the Mathis could stay in Ukarumpa, uh, especially as aircraft still needed to be maintained and so Kelvin's skills were still needed there. Uh, the maintenance team had a short break but were soon given special permission to work so Kelvin returned to servicing uh, fixed wing aircraft and helicopters uh, with no helicopter pilots because they had all returned to uh, their home countries. Uh, the helicopters were leased out to another organisation, but they still needed to be maintained. Ruth's literacy work, uh, including her English language lessons, had to stop. Uh, but she has more recently joined a team performing a, a service uh, review of their literacy and education unit. Restrictions were largely eased in Papua New Guinea mid-year uh, and things have been slowly returning to normal. Uh, fortunately, there were no cases of COVID-19 at Ukarumpa. I was particularly interested uh, to see that uh, coffee flights resumed. Uh, they're actually have a service in transporting sacks of raw coffee beans from the growers in remote villages to buyers in town, which is for them an extra source of income to support Bible translation. Hopefully, uh, they are also returning to their core work um, uh, in moving people around. Uh, in and out of villages who are engaged in the translation work. Uh, the Mathis family are planning to return to Australia and will be here uh, for the first half of next year. Uh, so we, have, uh, we hope to catch up with them in person uh, at that time. Uh, but in the meantime, you can uh, support the Mathis family uh, by uh, giving your mission donations this month uh, toward their work, uh, simply making a special deposit into the church bank account and uh, marking it uh, in the description as being for missions and all the mission funds this month will go towards their work. 
We'll come seeing as now going to lead us in prayer amongst other thing, he, things. He will remember uh, the Mathis family. Uh, and uh, following that, Gay is going to lead us uh, in the, the reading of our text for this morning. Philippians chapter 2 verse 11 reads, And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together this morning to worship you, to sing praises to you, and to listen to the preaching of your word. We praise you for the joys of creation as seen in the lovely spring days. We acknowledge that we are the children of your family. And so we offer our grateful thanks for all the love which you bestow upon us, for good health and daily food, for the shelter and care for our homes, for the love of family and friends which surround us. We rejoice in the knowledge that Jesus is alive and lives in each one of us. He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. May we show our commitment and our love to Him, and in doing so, receive His Spirit in our lives. We pray that the Spirit will work through us, helping us all to know You, to love You, and to do Your will. We thank You for the power of Your love, which manifests itself in so many ways. We thank you, Lord, now for the Church of which we are members and for the Holy Spirit at work amongst us all. Be with those who lead us in our worship of you. We pray your blessing on all who share with us in this Church's life, that we may all grow in a knowledge of your love. We pray that as a congregation, we may be aware of the needs of others. Help us as children of your family to respond to them by our understanding, by our support and by the love we show them. Father, we pray for your church throughout the world that it may share to the full in the work of your Son, revealing you to men and women and reconciling them to you and to one another. We pray that Christians may love one another and their neighbours as you loved us, and that, working together, they may bring peace to all people. We pray for all those troubled parts of the world where people are suffering as a result of fighting, of hunger, of disease, of losing their homes. Bring peace and hope and above all expressions of love into their lives. In particular, we think of those suffering from COVID-19 in North America, India, Brazil and the European countries and we pray that their distress may be relieved. Father, we thank you that there are no new cases of COVID-19 in Victoria over the past two weeks. We pray for wisdom and discernment to prevail for the Premier and the Cabinet in the steps for further easing of the restrictions in Melbourne. Father, we want to uphold Kelvin and Ruth Matis of the Wycliffe Bible Translators and their three children who are serving in Papua New Guinea. We thank you that COVID-19 has not had much impact in PNG so far and all of them have remained healthy. We thank you that Ruth's medications can be imported into PNG and Calvin's work has continued without much disruption and aircraft parts ordered from overseas have arrived in PNG smoothly. We pray for the nation of PNG that COVID-19 continue to stay under control. 
We also pray for Calvin and Ruth's home assignment plans, where they hope to spend the first half of the new year in Australia. Pray that you be gracious to them and make it happen so that they can reconnect with supporters and churches. We pray for help with their financial situation, which is tighter towards the end of a field term. We thank you, Father, for the online worship service. We pray that the gospel message brings encouragement, hope and peace that soften the hearts of people and lead them to Christ in amazing ways. We pray for Mook as he brings the message today, that he would be empowered by the Holy Spirit. May you anoint his lips and give him bonus to speak matters of your heart with clarity and love. We pray for ourselves. Give us attentive ears and open our hearts to receive your word this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The reading is from Acts 25, verses 1 to 12, the trial before Festus. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They urgently requested Festus, as a favour to them, to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held in Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Lest some of your leaders come with me and press charges against the man there, if he has done anything wrong. After spending eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Then Paul made his defence. I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favour, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. This is the word of the Lord. Just before Muk comes and preaches on this text this morning, uh, we're going to join again uh, in praise as we sing together the hymn, God Moves in a Mysterious Way. God moves. God moves in a mysterious way, His wonders to His footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, He treasures up His bright designs and works His sovereign will. Now you fearful saints The clouds you so much dread Are big with mercy and shall bring In the blessings of your hand And I will trust the hands that made the starry heavens And I will trust the wounds of Calvary And I will trust, I will not Lord. 
sense but trust him for his grace behind a frowning providence he hides his smiling face his purposes will ripen fast unfolding every hour the bud may have a bitter taste but sweet will be trust the hands that made the starry heavens and i will trust the words of calvary and i will trust i will not As we come to God's word now, let's bow our heads in prayer and ask him for his help and commit this time to him. So let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we now come before your word and we come humbly before your feet, knowing that we are needed to be taught, that we are needing to be nourished by your word. And we thank you for giving us this truth and prepare our hearts now, Lord, to listen to you to listen to what you have to tell us, to listen to just how great you are and how you are changing us and how you are moving us. And so we can humbly serve you and be glad and find joy in any life circumstance that we are in. In your name we pray. Amen. There is this important sports match coming up and the coach needs to um, finalise the team. Their best player, maybe the MVP of the league, has been playing amazing the whole year. And any hope of winning this game hinges on him leading this team. When the team is announced, however, his name is not there. He was left out on the team. He was left on the bench. Was this an oversight by the coach? Or had the coach just gone completely mad. Where we find ourselves today in Acts is where it might possibly seem that the best player for the church, the best advocate for the church is being sidelined. Paul should be running around from city to city as he was previously continuing on in his mission to plant churches, to share the gospel around Europe. But instead, where do we find him? We find he is in house arrest. We find that he is stuck at home, being guarded by the Roman officials, unable to go anywhere. Does this make any sense? Why would Paul be left to such limitations? As much as we desire a straightforward life, as much as we desire things to make sense, for our best place to always be out there, for the best people to be where we believe they should be in amongst action, we quickly realise that life doesn't always go that way. Things that might seem illogical happen. You go through the same routine each morning, but some days you feel horrible. You feel it's a struggle. You feel sluggish going through the day. You pray for God's blessing, but it seems that God has given you a day that's gone, that is anything but a blessing. That everything that can go wrong went wrong. We prepared so well for ministry, we prayed. We, put every, we crossed every T, dotted every I, had everything we prepared for to the best that we possibly could, yet 
the things that could have gone wrong went wrong. You know, when we are faced with these unexpected trials, when we are faced with these unexpected challenges in life, it is so easy to be discouraged. It is so easy to wonder, where is God in all of this? It's not just in these, I guess, extreme or obvious challenges, but I think just in life, we actually find it much easier to find things to be discouraged about. Rather than looking for the positives, rather than looking to what we can be encouraged, we look and seek for the things that discourage us. Sometimes it is easier to find things that put us down rather than finding things that strengthen and uphold us and actually build us in our character. And for the early church, how discouraging would it have been to see Paul Stuck in this way, stuck at home, not going around to the cities, encouraging, uplifting, and building churches. But we see that Paul has a different angle to this. His letter to the Philippians, his very first words in that letter was an encouragement to the Philippian church to not be discouraged, to not take his imprisonment as a sign that God has finished his work. And this is what he says in verses 12 in chapter 1 of Philippians. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that he has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold. To speak the word without fear. You see, Paul was encouraging the Philippians church that the gospel work hasn't finished because Paul is in prison. But it is continuing and advancing because Jesus is ruling from heaven. The church might be bound in chains. The best players might be restricted and limited in what they can do. But Jesus is never limited. He is ruling and he is running the world. He's running the church as the head. And he is everywhere doing his work. And as we look in today's passage, it is hard to look past that as Paul wrote that letter to the Philippians, he was remembering moments like this. He was remembering the times where he wanted to go out, be free, to share the gospel, but was stuck at home and the lessons that he learned from these valuable times. It is, it is funny how often we think or what we think is best for us, what we think is best for the gospel ministry, or what we think is best in general, isn't always the way that God moves his pieces. And we see in Paul's life that his ministry was full of arrests. It was f- sometimes there was doors that were closed. Perhaps the times that Paul thought going to this city and that city was the best thing, God closed the doors. And we see that he faced a lot of rejection these undesirable, unattractive side to ministry, we see that that was actually the reality. That was what God grants. It doesn't make all too much sense. Surely that one extra place that Paul could have reached would have been helpful for the gospel. Surely if he had not been arrested, surely all the times that he was beaten and thrown in prison, Those are valuable times lost. That's what we might think. But like a master tactician, being able to read the game three or four steps ahead and make moves that no one would imagine to make and would understand, God dictates every move according to his perfect will and his perfect plan. And the difference between a master tactician that we see on this earth is that they might only see three or four steps ahead. But we see that God is in control of everything. 
that everything is in his hands, that he has paved the way for his world, for his church. And we can take great comfort in that, that he's the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega. And there's nothing that happens in between the beginning and the end that is outside his control, that is outside his authority. And so even when things don't make sense to us, even when it seems to us that logic has been deserted, we find comfort in knowing that God is in control of all things. So here we are again. Two years after the trial before Phoenix, Paul is still in prison. And once again, on trial with now a new leader called Festus. Not much is known about Festus, apart from the fact that he didn't really last that long in his reign. And one of the major differences we see between Festus and Felix is that Festus was wanting to keep things rolling. He wanted to keep things moving. He wanted to build a relationship and a reputation with the Jewish people. And he also wanted to get this Paul situation sorted, something that Felix was reluctant to do. So he makes a trip down to Jerusalem and invites a few of the Jewish leaders there to come to Caesarea where they are able to question Paul. Now, compared to the previous chapters, the details of this trial is relatively brief, but still Luke tells us quite a few things that has happened in this trial. And the first thing that we learn is that there was a plan for an ambush. I mean, talk about holding a grudge over a long period of time. Despite the time lapse between the previous trial and this trial, the Jewish leaders still had Paul and his demise on their mind. It was at the forefront of their mind. This is what we read in verse 2 in Acts chapter 25. The chief priests and the principal men of the Jews laid out their case against Paul and they urged him, asking as a favour against Paul that he summon him to Jerusalem because here's the main, this is the main point here, they were planning an ambush to kill him on the way. So already we see that Paul's life, once again, is in danger. And the second thing that we see is that when Festus disagreed with this idea of sending Paul to Jerusalem, the Jews were happy to go to Caesarea for Paul's hearing, and this is what we read in verse 7, stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that could not be proven. It seemed like this was a case of a new leader, but same old problems. Paul is needing to defend himself once again from these false accusations. And let me try to put this into perspective a little bit. The first couple of years of Jethro... Um, we were needing to go in and out of hospital quite a lot because of his skin condition and because of his um, allergic reactions. The one thing that I can confidently say from this experience is that the last thing that anxious parents and nervous parents want to do is repeat themselves. Repeat themselves saying the same information to different doctors and nurses throughout the night. And this is pretty much what happened almost every time we needed to go into hospital. There will be a change in doctor and nurses, and every time a new person came in, they would ask the same questions as the previous doctor. And sometimes you would have to actually, I guess, tell them the information that the previous doctor told you to get them up to speed, as if they never communicate these things together amongst themselves before they take on their patience. Each time a new doctor came in, it almost felt like we were back to square one, that we weren't making all too much progress. 
Now, if you think how frustrating that is in a situation where someone is actually, in fact, trying to help us and trying to figure out what is wrong with Jezreel and how we can deal with it, I can only imagine the frustration that would have been with Paul during this time of imprisonment. I mean, this is not even touching on the, I guess, on the facts of his whole ministry. We're only just talking about the last couple of chapters. You know, his full ministry was just full of attacks and slander. But even just in the last few chapters, we see that he was arrested. He was almost flogged for no apparent reason. He was on trial. And now he's in house arrest. And with Felix, he was almost a hostage, really. He was held hostage for ransom. All because he was falsely accused of crimes and actions that he did not commit by the Jews. And now after a few years have passed to hear these accusations again and to needing to having to need to defend himself again saying the same things over and over and over again. I could only imagine what was going through his mind and the possible discouragement that came to him. Kent Hughes is helpful in capturing, I guess, the possible mood of this situation when he says, how the, apostle's soul must, how the apostle's soul must have longed for personal vindication, but also much more to be unleashed to minister the gospel freely wherever and to whomever he wished. So when we look at this, the duration in which Paul had been and will continue to be in house arrest. And the times he spent in prison and recovering from his physical conditions and beatings, it doesn't seem to make much sense that someone with such passion and power and authority and commitment to the gospel would be kept in this situation. Surely if God wanted his ministry to flourish, if he wanted more churches to be planted, if he wanted his plans to be fulfilled, Paul needed to be free. Surely Paul could not be stuck in this house arrest for much longer. He needed to be healthy. He needed to be strong. He needed to go to as many places as he possibly could, encouraging the church, uplifting the church, really encouraging to, to, to hold fast to the truth. But we see that this isn't the case here. And what we see going forward as well is that his release isn't any time soon. And we see in the next couple of chapters that his journey, it doesn't get much easier from here. So with all this negative, with all the, suppose, what seems to be a very discouraging story and event of life, you know, what can we get out of this? What can we learn? What is God doing? And one thing that I can see and what is clear despite the lack of luck and fortune that appears to be in Paul's life, is that God is still at work. God is still working. And this isn't God making the best out of a really bad situation, you know, making the best out of something that Paul got himself into. You know, this isn't a problem-solving exercise for God to which we are able to see whether he's able to get Paul out of this trouble or not. We see that God is sovereign. He is in complete control of every event, of every move, with every word that has been spoken. And to our bemusement, perhaps, he kept Paul exactly where he was supposed to be at this very point in time. In his letter to the Ephesians, 
He says, this is what Paul says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And in his commentary on this passage, a Puritan, Thomas Goodwin, wrote, He plotted everything beforehand. God's will shall stand and it shall not be resisted. And we are not just talking about the big picture in this instance. All the little events, the things that we might think are irrelevant, random, inconsequential, All things are in his control. All things are under his authority. And nothing that is going on in this world is outside outside his counsel. He works everything according to the counsel of his will. And this is what we see in Paul's trial here today. And the first way we see this is Festus' actions, which serve God's purpose. After the Jews request that Paul be transferred to Jerusalem, this is what Festus says. He replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So he said to the Jewish leaders, let the men of the authority among you go down with me. And if there is anything wrong about the man who is Paul, Let them bring charges against him. I thought this was, this is a good opportunity to clear something up. There is no indication that Festus had a whiff of, I guess, the Jewish plan of an ambush. Therefore, it is a far cry to claim that Festus was out there trying to protect Paul at all costs. As we later see, in fact, that he was willing to hand Paul over to the Jews after he gave his defence. This is what we read in verse 9. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favour, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? You see, that he was more than happy to hand Paul over to the Jews. And not for the first time with Paul's handlers. He just wanted to get Paul off the books. Just get this situation sorted. Whichever way it turns out to be, yes, we need a fair trial. But at the end of the day, what he wanted was just to get rid of this situation with Paul. But what we do see in that God's sovereign goodness, that he used Festus' willingness at the beginning of his rule to have diplomacy and to have a fair trial. And through These actions of Festus, he unknowingly was able to save Paul from these ambushes. And that was all guided by the sovereign hand of God. The second we see of God's hand in this situation is Paul's actions, which once again serve God's purposes. This is what we read in verse 10. As Festus threatened to send Paul to Jerusalem, Paul replied, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you yourself know very well. If then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything for which I deserve to die, I do not seek to escape. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. Paul's quick thinking here turned this situation from something that potentially could have been very, very dangerous to going to the, finally going to the city that the Lord was sending him to. Did Paul know once again about this ambush? It's hard to say that he did. 
but what we could probably assume that he had a greater sense of danger of going to the of going to Jerusalem than Festus did earlier when he rejected the Jewish proposal. And so now through the quick wittiness of Paul, the quick mindedness of Paul, now our attention turns to Rome where he's finally able to go to where God was leading him all the way back in chapter 23, verse 11, where the Lord said to him, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome. In this situation, I don't think anyone could be blamed to think that this is just a lucky break for Paul. Paul himself wouldn't, wouldn't have imagined that this was the way that he was going to go to Rome as a prisoner. Not sure if that was ever on his mind. But what is certain from God's word is that Paul, no matter what, will testify and share the gospel in Rome. There were suggestions that Paul, during this time, was trying to seek refuge in the Roman law, thinking that that will bring greater protection for him than the Jewish law. As much as that might have been true, there's no indications to suggest that this was what was on Paul's mind at the time. In fact, we see later, a little bit later on, that the, the Caesar that he's going to is Nero just before he goes on a riot against the church. So there's no indication that Paul was trying to protect himself and find safer refuge. Rather, we see that he might have taken this opportunity to finally make inroads in getting to the place where God was trying to send him. And he was able to do this because he was certain about this promise. When God had spoken to him, he was sure that this would happen. He wasn't sure how it was going to happen and how it was going to be done. But he knew this, that God is faithful. God is a God who never breaks his promise. God is never failing that nothing that he says is false and nothing that he says will never come to pass. He is never failing. And friends, I would like to ask you this morning, how closely do we hold to this truth in our hearts? That when life is messy, when life goes in a way that we do not expect, when life gets bleak, where there's doesn't seem there's any sign of hope in what we're doing, any sign of progress in the road that we are taking. Whether it is in life, whether it is in the gospel ministry, only a few years ago when we tried to go to homes, it seemed like there was roadblocks everywhere, doors being shut, difficult to get into. In those situations, does the truth that God is ever faithful, that God is never failing, does that stay in our hearts? Do we hold on to those truths? And hence, does that lead us to just trust in him? That if God was to open the doors, he will open it in the way that he pleases, in the way that is perfect in his will and plan. Are we able to look past the disappointment of our experiences? Look past the disappointment that life has not met our expectations? To look to heaven. To look to the God who is ruling. The Christ who laid his life down for us so that we are saved. That we might be reconciled to God and now sits at the right hand of God 
full dominion and rule, sovereign king of his creation? Do we look to him and find hope and find encouragement that someday all this, things that we don't understand, will all make sense? Do we look to God? Or do we just drown in our own disappointment of where we are in life? It is true, friends. It can be really difficult to understand. Sometimes God's way and his perfect plan, it's it's just so difficult to understand because it just doesn't align with our expectations and thinking. And one of the major ways that he doesn't always meet our expectations is that he doesn't remove all our obstacles and all our challenges that come our way. A conversation with a friend, or I had a very interesting conversation with a friend um, just this week about growing up in church and what he's been able to observe lately with talking to some of his youth group kids is that many children and students who grow up in the church grow to have an unrealistic expectation and view of this world. And this comes from various reasons. It's because at church they've been spoon-fed. At church they've been overprotected. At church, they've been complimented and praised for even just the little things or any time that they might serve in any aspect of the church. Criticism and teaching is scarce. And so when they go out into the world, they are unable to face the challenges of criticism, harshness, and in fact, just the reality of this world. And so they grow in fear. They grow scared. They are shaken by this rude awakening that life isn't all smiles and driving down the freeway at 100 kilometers per hour. There's going to be bumps in the road. There are going to be challenges. And perhaps the challenge for the church is not to hide and protect ourselves from the reality of the world, but to humbly submit to and find hope and rest in the providence of God, to find hope and rest in the sovereignty of God, knowing that everything is under his control, that he's working everything for our good. Because the church isn't a bubble where all pain and suffering go away. And church shouldn't be a bubble where we show our young generation that being a Christian means pain and suffering will no longer exist in your life. But church is a community that reminds each other that we can endure, we can grow that we are able to go through all trials and affliction because we have Christ who gives us strength. If that sounds familiar to you, how often do people take Philippians 4.13 out of context? When Paul was saying that through any affliction, through any challenges, No matter what the cost of him sharing the gospel, he is able to withstand and endure all temptation and hurt because it is Christ who gives him strength. We have a God who doesn't desert his people but fulfills his promise, who does his gospel work through them in his sovereign goodness. He works everything for our good. Over the last six months, and this is once again reminding me of the reality of this world, 
and maybe sometimes a fantasy that we might have. Over the past six months, after not having done much exercise, I've never found it harder to go out for a jog. I struggle to catch my breath every single time, although it does get better. First time I went out, my head started spinning. My lungs felt like my throat felt like it was going dry. And my legs felt like it was carrying weights that I'd never carried before. And so often, as much as I love exercise, as much as I love sports, I just wanted to give up. It just got way too hard. But I was reminded to get to, I was reminded that in order to get to the level of fitness that I am desiring to get to, these are the pains that need to be overcome. The days where I could eat a hamburger and play sports two minutes later is no longer possible. And likewise, the reality in this broken world is that injustice, unfairness, hurt, trials, they are going to hit our lives. And just as sometimes we fantasize and wish that we could just do anything without working for it, that we are able to get to a level of fitness and a level of skill without practicing and putting in the hard work and going through this pain. Perhaps there's this unrealistic expectation in our hearts that we can grow in holiness and righteousness without going through the suffering and without going through the providential affliction, the challenges and obstacles that God puts us through to build our character. Now, I would like to suggest that it's in fact the other way around. It would be awfully strange and suspicious if anyone claimed that they did not face any challenges in life, that there was no hardships, and that God had blessed their road so that they would never have to taste evil, they would never have to taste hardship. But this is the hope that we have. The hope isn't that every hard and difficult thing in our lives will be eliminated. But the hope is in Romans 5, that we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because of this. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Friends, our suffering doesn't mean God deserted us. As so often we might think and feel. And part of a lot of the the discouragement that comes is it feels like what God has promised isn't working out in our life, almost as if God has forgotten us in this point in time. But what Paul reminds us is that God's life has been poured into our hearts. The Holy Spirit has been given to us through the saving work of Christ. To all his people, he has given us the Holy Spirit so that we can rejoice in our sufferings, that we can, so that this suffering produces endurance it builds character and that we have hope in not our situation and what we have on earth, what we gain and the material things that we might earn, but we look to heaven, to our God, who has given us life, who has given us the ability to endure, who has given us the assurance that he will one day call us home. And there we will find eternal rest. So what lessons can we learn here, friends, from our afflictions? Or what what is one lesson that we can see that Paul is learning here? The Heidelberg Catechism, question 28, 
when it talks about the meaning of providence and what advantage it has for us. This is the answer that it gives, that we may be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and that in all things which may hereafter before us, we place our firm trust in our faithful God and Father, that nothing shall separate us from his love. And from his years of waiting in his home, staying, imprisoned, unable to go out, how many times will Paul's patience have been tested? But Paul, through all his suffering and all his trials, not just in this particular arrest, in all his experiences, was able to learn patience. He was always thankful, and his firm trust and hope was only in one, and that is in Jesus Christ. And this is what he says to the Philippians, that I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Friends, do we come with the same confidence as Paul? Do we trust that the one who saved us will lead us and guide us? Do we trust that the one who saved us will continue to build our lives and build our character, do what is best for us till the day he calls us home? Do we trust that the one who saved us will complete his work, the work that he started when he walked this earth 2,000 years ago? Complete the work through the Holy Spirit in the hearts and lives of his church today that he will go out and save those he saves, transforms the lives of those he transforms. As John MacArthur says, that God has perfectly built his kingdom. If the world was to stop today, he has already called all those who he has called to his kingdom in his love and good grace. No, we don't always know what is going on. No, not everything always makes sense. We don't always know why God has brought us to a certain point in life in our journey. But what we can be sure is that God is in control. And we can be sure that God will complete his work and that he is building his kingdom here. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we we just come humbly before your feet. So many times we think we know what is best. So many times we think just because in the spare of the moment, these events, these ways seem good, It will attract the most attention, draw the biggest crowds. I guess when we look at it as a society is the most acceptable and it's the the most accurate representation of success, we think that that is your will. But Father, you have shown us that you take us on roads and paths that we can never expect that you build the church in the way that we could, we can sometimes never have seen coming. But we know and trust that that is all in your good works and plans, that you, have compl- you will complete the work and that you will build your kingdom in the way that you desire. So help us to be humble and submit to your providence so that we may be able to serve you and that we may be able to grow in our character and our endurance so that no matter what trials and afflictions come our way, we know that we are able to endure it because it is Christ who gives us strength. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen. As we close our sermon, let's sing this song.
Be thou my vision. So many times we don't know what is coming ahead of us, but we find comfort knowing that Jesus is our vision, that he has the plans in his hands and that we are just needing to follow him. So let's sing this song together. conclude our service with the words and encouragement from Romans 15. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, some by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain I'm fixed upon.